Meditations in Monmouth Street by Charles Dickens Read by Christian Dickinson We have always entertained a particular attachment towards Monmouth Street as the only true and real emporium for second-hand wearing apparel. Monmouth Street is venerable from its antiquity and respectable from its usefulness. Hollywell Street we despise. The red-headed and red-whiskered Jews who forcibly haul you into their squalid houses and thrust you into a suit of clothes, whether you will or not, we detest. The inhabitants of Monmouth Street are a distinct class, a peaceable and retiring race who immure themselves for the most part in deep cellars or small back parlors, and who seldom come forth into the world except in the dusk and coolness of the evening when they may be seen seated in chairs on the pavement, smoking their pipes, or watching the gambols of their engaging children as they revel in the gutter, a happy troop of infantine scavengers. Their countenances bear a thoughtful and dirty cast, certain indications of their love of traffic, and their habitations are distinguished by that disregard of outward appearance and neglect of personal comfort so common among people who are constantly immersed in profound speculations and deeply engaged in sedentary pursuits. We have hinted at the antiquity of our favorite spot. A Monmouth Street laced coat was a byword a century ago, and still we find Monmouth Street the same. Pilot greatcoats with wooden buttons have usurped the place of the ponderous laced coats with full skirts. Embroidered waistcoats with large flaps have yielded to double-breasted checks with roll collars, and three-corner hats of quaint appearance have given place to the low crowns and broad brims of the coachman's school. But it is the times that have changed, not Monmouth Street. Through every alteration and every change, Monmouth Street has still remained the burial place of the fashions. And such, to judge from all present appearances, it will remain until there are no more fashions to bury. We love to walk among these extensive groves of the illustrious dead, and to indulge in the speculations to which they give rise, now fitting a deceased coat, then a dead pair of trousers, and anon the mortal remains of a gaudy waistcoat, upon some being of our own conjuring up, in endeavoring, from the shape and fashion of the garment itself, to bring its former owner before our mind's eye. We have gone on speculating in this way, until whole rows of coats have started from their pegs and buttoned up of their own accord round the waists of imaginary wearers. Lines of trousers have jumped down to meet them. Waistcoats have almost burst with anxiety to put themselves on. And half an acre of shoes have suddenly found feet to fit them. And gone stumping down the street with a noise which has fairly awakened us from our pleasant reverie, and driven us slowly away, with a bewildered stare, an object of astonishment to the good people of Monmouth Street, and of no slight suspicion to the policemen at the opposite street corner. We were occupied in this manner the other day, endeavoring to fit a pair of laced-up half-boots on an ideal personage, for whom, to say the truth, they were full a couple of sizes too small. When our eyes happened to alight on a few suits of clothes ranged outside a shop window, which it immediately struck us, must at different periods have belonged to, and been worn by, the same individual. And now, by one of those strange conjunctions of circumstances which will occur sometimes, come to be exposed together for sale in the same shop. The idea seemed a fantastic one, and we looked at the clothes again, with a firm determination not to be easily led away. No, we were right. The more we looked, the more we were convinced of the accuracy of our previous impression. There was the whole man's life written as legibly on those clothes, as if we had his autobiography engrossed on parchment before us. The first was a patched and much-soiled skeleton suit, one of those straight blue cloth cases in which small boys used to be confined before belts and tunics had come in and old notions had gone out. An ingenious contrivance for displaying the full symmetry of a boy's figure by fastening him into a very tight jacket with an ornamental row of buttons over each shoulder and then buttoning his trousers over it so as to give his legs the appearance of being hooked on just under the armpits. This was the boy's dress. It had belonged to a town boy, we could see, there was a shortness about the legs and arms of the suit, and a bagging at the knees peculiar to the rising youth of London streets. A small day school he had been at, evidently. If it had been a regular boys' school, they wouldn't have let him play on the floor so much, and rub his knees so white. He had an indulgent mother, too, and plenty of halfpence, as the numerous smears of some sticky substance about the pockets, and just below the chin, which even the salesman's skill could not succeed in disguising, sufficiently betokened. They were decent people, 
but not overburdened with riches, or he would not have so far outgrown the suit when he passed into those corduroys with a round jacket, in which he went to a boy's school, however, and learned to write, in an ink of pretty tolerable blackness, too, if the place where he used to wipe his pen might be taken as evidence. A black suit and the jacket changed into a diminutive coat. His father had died, and the mother had got the boy a message lad's place in some office. A long-worn suit, that one, rusty and threadbare before it was laid aside, but clean and free from soil to the last. Poor woman. We could imagine her assumed cheerfulness over the scanty meal, and the refusal of her own small portion that her hungry boy might have enough. Her constant anxiety for his welfare, her pride in his growth mingled sometimes with the thought, almost too acute to bear, that as he grew to be a man his old affection might cool, old kindnesses fade from his mind, and old promises be forgotten. The sharp pain that even then a careless word or a cold look would give her, all crowded on our thoughts as vividly as if the very scene were passing before us. These things happen every hour, and we all know it, and yet we felt as much sorrow when we saw, or fancied we saw, it makes no difference which, the change that began to take place now, as if we had just conceived the bare possibility of such a thing for the first time. The next suit, smart but slovenly, meant to be gay, and yet not half so decent as the threadbare apparel, regulant of the idle lounge, and the blackguard companions told us, we thought, that the widow's comfort had rapidly faded away. We could imagine that coat, imagine, we could see it, we had seen it a hundred times, sauntering in company with three or four other coats of the same cut about some place of profligate resort at night. We dressed from the same shop window in an instant, half a dozen boys of from fifteen to twenty, and putting cigars into their mouths and their hands into their pockets, watched them as they sauntered down the street and lingered at the corner with the obscene jest and the oft-repeated oath. We never lost sight of them till they had cocked their hats a little more on one side and swaggered into the public house, and then we entered the desolate home, where the mother sat late in the night alone. We watched her as she paced the room with feverish anxiety, and every now and then opened the door, looked wistfully into the dark and empty street, and again returned to be again and again disappointed. We beheld the look of patience with which she bore the brutish threat, nay, even the drunken blow, and we heard the agony of tears that gushed from her very heart as she sank upon her knees in her solitary and wretched apartment. A long period had elapsed, and a greater change had taken place by the time of casting off the suit that hung above. It was that of a stout, broad-shouldered, sturdy-chested man, and we knew at once, as anybody would, who glanced at that broad-skirted green coat with the large metal buttons, that its wearer seldom walked forth without a dog at his heels, and some idle ruffian, the very counterpart of himself, at his side. The vices of the boy had grown with the man, and we fancied his home then, if such a place deserved the name. We saw the bare and miserable room, destitute of furniture, crowded with his wife and children, pale, hungry, and emaciated. The man cursing their lamentations, staggering to the tap room, from whence he had just returned, followed by his wife and a sickly infant, clamoring for bread, and heard the street wrangle and noisy recrimination that his striking her occasioned. And then imagination led us to some metropolitan workhouse, situated in the midst of a crowded streets and alleys, filled with noxious vapors, and ringing with boisterous cries, where an old and feeble woman, imploring pardon for her son, lay dying in a close dark room, with no child to clasp her hand, and no pure air from heaven to fan her brow. A stranger closed the eyes that settled into a cold, unmeaning glare, and strange ears received the words that murmured from the white and half-closed lips. A coarse round frock, with a worn cotton neckerchief and other articles of clothing of the commonest description, completed the history. A prison and the sentence. Banishment or the gallows. What would the man have given, then, to be once again the contented, humble drudge of his boyish years, to have restored to life, but for a week, a day, an hour, a minute, only for so long a time as would enable him to say one word of passionate regret to, and hear one sound of heartfelt forgiveness from, the cold and ghastly form that lay rotting in the pauper's grave. The children wild in the streets, the mother a destitute widow, both deeply tainted with the deep disgrace of the husband and father's name, and impelled by sheer necessity, down the precipice that had led him to a lingering death, possibly of many years' duration, thousands of miles away. We had no clue to the end of the tale, but it was easy to guess its termination. 
we took a step or two further on, and by way of restoring the naturally cheerful tone of our thoughts, began fitting visionary feet and legs into a cellar board full of boots and shoes, with a speed and accuracy that would have astonished the most expert artist in leather living. There was one pair of boots in particular, a jolly, good-tempered, hearty-looking pair of tops that excited our warmest regard, and we had got a fine, red-faced, jovial fellow of a market gardener into them before we had made their acquaintance half a minute. They were just the very thing for him. There were his huge, fat legs bulging over the tops and fitting them too tight to admit of his tucking in the loops he had pulled them on by, and his knee cords with an interval of stocking, and his blue apron tucked up round his waist, and his red neckerchief and blue coat, and a white hat stuck on one side of his head, and there he stood with a broad grin on his great red face, whistling away, as if any other idea but that of being happy and comfortable had never entered his brain. This was the very man after our own heart. We knew all about him. We had seen him coming up to Convent Garden in his green chase cart, with a fat, tubby little horse, half a thousand times. And even while we cast an affectionate look upon his boots at that instant, the form of a coquettish servant maid suddenly sprung into a pair of Denmark satin shoes that stood beside them, and we at once recognized the very girl who accepted his offer of a ride, just on this side of the Hammersmith suspension bridge, the very last Tuesday morning we rode into town from Richmond. A very smart female in showy bonnet stepped into a pair of gray cloth boots with black fringe and binding that were studiously pointing out their toes on the other side of the top boots and seemed very anxious to engage his attention but we didn't observe that our friend the market gardener appeared at all captivated with these blandishments. For beyond giving a knowing wink when they first began, as if to imply he quite understood their end and object, he took no further notice of them. His indifference, however, was amply recompensed by the excessive gallantry of a very old gentleman with a silver-headed stick, who tottered into a pair of large list shoes that were standing in one corner of the board, and indulged in a variety of gestures expressive of his admiration of the lady in the cloth boots, to the immeasurable amusement of a young fellow we put into a pair of long-quartered pumps, who we thought would have split the coat that slid down to meet him with laughing. We had been looking on at this little pantomime with great satisfaction for some time, when, to our unspeakable astonishment, we perceived that the whole of the characters, including a numerous corps de ballet of boots and shoes in the background, into which we had been hastily thrusting as many feet as we could press into the service, were arranging themselves in order for dancing. And some music striking up at the moment, to it they went without delay. It was perfectly delightful to witness the agility of the market gardener. Out went the boots, first on one side, then on the other, then cutting, then shuffling, then setting to the Denmark satins, then advancing, then retreating, then going round, and then repeating the whole of the evolutions again, without appearing to suffer in the least from the violence of the exercise. Nor were the Denmark satins a bit behindhand, for they jumped and bounded about in all directions, and though they were neither so regular nor so true to the time as the cloth boots, still, as they seemed to do it from the heart and to enjoy it more, we candidly confess that we preferred their style of dancing to the other. But the old gentleman in the list shoes was the most amusing object of the whole party, for, Besides his grotesque attempts to appear youthful and amorous, which were sufficiently entertaining in themselves, the young fellow in the pumps managed so artfully that every time the old gentleman advanced to salute the lady in the cloth boots, he trod with his whole weight on the old fellow's toes, which made him roar with anguish and rendered all the others like to die of laughing. We were in the full enjoyment of those festivities when we heard a shrill and by no means musical voice exclaim, Hope you'll know me again, Emperance! and on looking intently forward to see from whence the sound came, we found that it proceeded, not from the young lady in the cloth boots, as we had first been inclined to suppose, but from a bulky lady of elderly appearance, who was seated in a chair at the head of the cellar steps, apparently for the purpose of superintending the sale of the articles arranged there. A barrel organ, which had been in full force close behind us, ceased playing. The people we had been fitting into the shoes and boots took flight at the interruption and as we were conscious that in the depth of our meditations we might have been rudely staring at the old lady for half an hour without knowing it, we took to flight too, and were soon immersed in the deepest obscurity of the adjacent dials. <laughs>